Absolutely. It's hard for me to imagine that AI will not play a meaningful impact in medicine. I don't think it will be on the time scale that people talk about it. I think people yeah. talk about it like, oh, we're just two years away from this. The, I don't think that's the, the case. The chatbot's not quite accurate enough yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there are areas where it's already making a difference. Uh, in radiology, for example, oh, yeah. it's it's already making a difference. Uh, will it rise to the level of, you know, a person walks into the ER and you can gather all this information from them and make decisions? Uh, yeah, but you got to remember, you have to be able to train the AI. And this is what makes medicine a little bit more messy is, you know, you need an unbiased data set and then you need, like, you need an unbiased data sample on which you train the AI and then you have to be able to validate it on a, a sort of a comparable sample. Yeah. And I think that's just harder to do with messy things like people. Well, it's like, what's the survivorship bias, the selection bias in, in a given profession, right? And the logic or the constraints of that profession almost always create a specific type of person. And that person is good at functioning in that system, usually at the expense of not functioning well in other things or, or being good at other things. That makes sense, especially for doctors, because they have to do so much fine tuning to get to be good in working that system. Yeah, I think your point is really a, a good one, which is we are selecting generation after generation after generation for a subset of people who do well and who, who and, 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 you know, like I don't ever want to live in a world where we don't have really good, competent, capable doctors. I don't want to live in a world where the best and the brightest wouldn't dream of going into medicine. I can't speak to what the stats are today. Like I would, I would gather that there is a historical trend line that shows a waxing and waning of where the top talent go. Like where exactly. do the best and brightest out of college go? How many of them are going to Goldman Sachs? How many of them are starting going to startup companies in the Silicon Valley? How many of them are going into medicine or law or business school? Like. You know, and my guess is medicine is falling behind. Is there some hope over the next 10 or 20 years? Are there new paradigms? How do we fix this? Like, what's the positive outcome here for how healthcare and medicine is, is better 20 years from now? You know, look, I think the knee jerk answer is technology, right? We can sort of talk about that as like kind of a throwaway term. Like technology will fix everything. Um, and it, I think it will fix some things. We, we have a fundamental problem in the United States with healthcare, though, which is if we're not careful, it will bankrupt us. Right. Mm -hmm. So we, we, it, it's, uh, it's, it's not become very fashionable to talk about this anymore. We've sort of forgotten about this, but you know, we do on a per capita basis and in absolute dollars spend more on healthcare than any country in the world. We're not even in the same zip code as the next countries and our ROI across the board is not great. We have a, we have a very high ROI for the people who can access the best healthcare. But if you consider the entire population, we're actually doing a pretty bad job, especially when you consider what we're paying for. So um, I, I actually worry a bit about that problem, which is that you know if you start spending 37% of your GDP on healthcare, like at some point you can't keep up. Yeah. Like you can't have enough GDP to make that I, equation work. I spend a lot of my time on the health policy and my, my framework is there's like five or six areas of healthcare that are each just captured by cronyism and captured by cartels. And so it's like, there's like the healthcare groups, including the nonprofit hospitals, they buy everything and they raise prices. Yep. There's there's pharma companies doing all sorts of sketchy things to kind of keep drugs longer and keep patents harder to work with. You know, there's the PBMs in the middle middlemen. Frankly, the, the AMA and the doctors groups do all sorts of things to stop the AI from being allowed to work with nurses. Even if the nurse plus AI is better than a doctor, they'll ban it, right? And they'll pass laws. And the list goes on and on and on. And you can't even start a new medical school these days. It takes longer to start a new medical school than it took us to fight World War II. I mean, it's just, it's just insane how these things work. Well, I think it's a lot like the obesity change or diabetes change over 50 years. There's no one thing, but all of those things do add up. And, and I think, you know, one way that I, I think is, uh, that I reflect on this is basically looking at what's good and bad about other systems, right? So mm -hmm. I grew up in Canada, and as you know, Canada's got a very socialized system. And I don't think it's a great system, by the way. So yep. one of the things that vexes me was when I hear Americans talk about, oh my God, if we just had Canada's healthcare system, I'm like, knock yourselves out. Like, I wouldn't wanna live in Canada if my life depended on it, no offense to my Canadian brethren. And the reason is um, you can't get anything done. Like there's, you know, if, if you need an MRI, like you can have it in a year. You have to wait for everything because right. there's no markets at all. But here's yeah. where Canada's better. Nobody falls through the cracks. Yep. So it seems to me there mu the, the solution has to be a hybrid that takes the best of both systems and abolishes the worst of both systems. 100%. And the worst of the American system is the risk ownership piece. 
This is the problem. There is a total disconnect between demand and risk. So I'll give you an example. So I had a friend who used to, he was an expat that lived in Saudi Arabia. And anybody who's been to Saudi Arabia will know you don't really want to spend summers there. So, you know, he would come back to DC from like June till September. And I don't know how it came up one day, we were having dinner and I, I, I sort of said, oh dude, what's it like when you get back to your apartment in September? Is it like 150 degrees? And he's like, no, it's 70 degrees. I'm like, how? He's like, I leave the air conditioning on the whole summer. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's insane. How much does that cost? He's like $20. And I was like, of course, oh, like it's paying, totally it's subsidized. Like energy is free. is free in Saudi Arabia. That's funny. But then you, was, wait, you waste it. It's like crazy. Yeah. So it's like <laughs> when you don't bear the cost, when you don't have skin Just in the game, it, it doesn't matter. And that's the fundamental issue with the US healthcare system. Nobody has any skin in the game. No, Nobody has any skin totally in the agree. game. We, got, we, we, need, we need more markets on some parts and we need to take care of the bottom on the other parts yeah. and, and combine so them you, too. You, you yeah. need a uniform system that nobody falls through the cracks. Nobody should, going to, to, nobody should be going to an emergency room for general health, right? Nobody yep. should use an ER, which is marked up 87 times yep. as their primary care doctor for general health maintenance for preventative health. Uh, but at the same time, we can't live in a place like Canada where a, per a person should be able to have private insurance where if they wanna pay a premium, they should be able to get a service.